Mahaba, and welcome to a new episode of The Doc Is In, where Cleveland Clinic Ava Dabby's expert physicians and dedicated caregivers converge to explore the dynamic intersection of technology, compassionate care, and cutting edge research to help deliver the best patient outcomes. Join us as we dive into transformative advancements shaping the forefront of healthcare, sparking conversations that bridge innovation with patient-centered excellence. From the latest healthcare innovations to the frontiers of surgical procedures and technologies, we'll cover it all. So whether you're a medical professional, science enthusiast, clinician, or just an avid podcast listener looking to expand your horizons, this is the podcast for you. My name is Prudence Marshall, and I will be your host for today's episode brought to you by the Fatima Bin Mubarak Center here at Cleveland Clinic Abu Dhabi. Before we dive in, remember to hit like, subscribe, and turn on the notifications button as the doc is in, needs to be your number one healthcare podcast. So whether you're about to buckle up for a drive, get ready for a run or warm up a cup of coffee, join us now as the doc is in. Here with me for today's episode is Dr. Stephanie Ritchie. Dr. Ritchie is a fellowship trained surgical oncologist here at the Fatima Bin Mubarak Center at Cleveland Clinic Abu Dhabi. Dr. Ritchie received her medical degree from the University of Connecticut School of Medicine in the US where she also completed her residency in obstetrics and gynecology. Following her residency, Dr. Ritchie completed a fellowship of gynecologic oncology at the John Hopkins University in the United States. Throughout her career, Dr. Ritchie has specialized in gynecologic oncology, completing over 3,000 procedures from minimally invasive surgeries to cytoreductive surgeries with heated intraperitoneal chemotherapy. Her research interests have focused on patient care, including unit tumors, time to treatment, and survivorship for gynecological cancer survivors. Welcome, Dr. Ritchie, to The Doc Is In. It is a pleasure to have you here with us today. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Um, an incredibly impressive CV. Um, before we dive in, the surgical oncology specialty, I just am so excited to discuss with you today. Um, and we're going to be discussing advanced endometrial cancer. Um, we're going to talk about both the combination of immunotherapy and chemotherapy for advanced disease. And in our discussion today for our listeners, we're going to be referencing two very recent peer-reviewed clinical trials um, published by the New England Journal of Medicine and their place in the field of gynecologic oncology. Um, I had an opportunity to review what you'd shared with me for today's discussion, and I must say they offer really promising I suppose, results, advancements in endometrial um, cancer. Exciting work. Mm -hmm. Wonderful to see. So before we dive in, we'll get a current state. Where are we for current treatment options on endometrial cancer as of today? So interestingly, endometrial cancer is a cancer which, you know, a lot of, we've seen a lot of um, great advances in solid tumor. And uh, most incidences and survival rates, incidences are going down, survival rates are going up. Um, which is wonderful. However, in mutual cancer, the incidence is rising and survival is actually decreasing. Uh, so it's one of the few cancers that um, we've had over the last you know, few years, we've had sort of a, a negative trend. Okay. So obviously getting clinical trials like this is a step in the right direction, yes. I guess you could say. Um, the clinical just trials that we're going to discuss, they are specifically about the use of immunotherapy with chemotherapy Correct. for Correct. advanced cancer care. Um, can you share with us, for those listening, particularly that mightn't be in the surgical oncology field for gynecological oncology, what is immunotherapy and, and what do you think its role is in endometrial cancer? Yeah, so uh, to be clear, right now the backbone of treatment for advanced stage endometrial cancer, which is stage three and four, is uh, chemotherapy with carboplatin and paclitaxel, plus or minus radiation depending on the okay. stage and, and you know where the disease is. So what was revolutionary about these trials is that they added immunotherapy to that, that carboplatin, paclitaxel, chemotherapy backbone. Okay. Um, and the results that they, that they um, got from this addition were, were really phenomenal for both what's called MMR deficient and MMR proficient endometrial cancer. Okay. So we know that uh, endometrial cancer, which is um, deficient in MMR, which stands for microsatellite um, instability. Um, so, so cancers that have a lot of this microsatellite instability 
um, react very, or rather respond very well to immunotherapy. But historically in clinical trials, you know, the other group, which is the majority of, sort of uh, endometrial cancers, about 70% seven, of endometrial cancers are proficient in um, this uh, microsatellite stability. So okay. th that means that they are microsatellite stable. And they historically have not reacted or responded as well to immunotherapy. Um, and so one thing that was pretty amazing in this trial is that we found that the, um, that both of these groups of women um, had excellent response rates when immunotherapy was added to chemotherapy. So exactly how does immunotherapy work? So in these two trials, uh, one trial looked at pembrolizumab and the other trial looked at dastarlamab. Both of these drugs are what, what are called PD-1 inhibitors. And what happens is when we have a cancer in our body, um, our tumor cell, the tumor cells are, are very, very crafty. And our immune system recognizes that these are foreign cells because even though they're our own native tissue, they've gone rogue, right? right? Cancer cells are normal cells that have transformed into bad actors and now they're growing out of control. And so our immune system recognizes this, that they're not, they're not towing the line, if you will. And so that's what the immune system's there for, is to keep our cells in check when, when you know, mistakes occur and, and cells start acting in a way they shouldn't be. So what cancer cells have evolved to do is they produce something called a, a PD-1 ligand. And what that does is it, it connects to the um, PD-1 receptor on, um, on one of our immune cells, like a T cell, for example. And that tells the T cell, no, we're cool. You don't need to be bugging me. Uh, you know, so it shuts off the immune system. So the mm -hmm. cancer cells sort of fly under the radar of our immune system and go unrecognized. Um, and so what these immunotherapy drugs do is they bind to that PD-1 receptor on the immune cell so that they, the immune system can't be shut off by the tumor cells. So it's pretty amazing stuff. No hiding. No, no hiding, exactly. <laughs> okay. That, yeah, like, I mean, it, it, it's fascinating. Um, so these two trials that you had, they've both had this combination. So they've taken our existing treatment methodologies exactly. and they've, they've added the immunotherapy in. Mm -hmm. Can you interpret the results of the, each individual trial for us, for those listening at home between the sure. two immunotherapies and sure. kind of summarize what you think the results of each of those trials were? Yeah, so... Exactly. So what, um, what the pembrolizumab trial did, as well as, as the dastrolimab trial, is they took an existing um, treatment with carboplatin and paclitaxel, which we would all give to our endometrial cancer patients, and they added pembrolizumab or dastrolimab to that okay. um, treatment regimen. So for six cycles of chemotherapy, you then also got six cycles of the immunotherapy drug. Following that, um, and so this, the, the, both trials were randomized trials, okay. meaning that half the women got the immunotherapy drug and half the women got a placebo. Okay. After they finished their, but everybody got carboplatin and paclitaxel, okay, because that's standard of care. After they finished their carboplatin and paclitaxel, their six cycles, um, either you received um, pembrolizumab or dastrolimab only for up to 14 cycles, okay. um, or you received placebo only for up to 14 cycles. So there was also the addition of that kind of maintenance period, which we didn't, didn't have, have before. before. Um, and the results were just stunning. So in the, in the pembrolizumab trial, I'm going to read directly from the trial so I don't get the numbers incorrect. But um, from the pembrolizumab trial, there was actually a 70% lower risk of disease progression or death um, in women with, who are deficient in MMR, okay, in that mm -hmm. cohort. Um, and there was actually a 40% lower risk um, in the proficient MMR group, um, which is compared to, compared to placebo, which is amazing. I mean, those we hadn't seen those in a in a clinical trial since the introduction of carboplatin and paclitaxel. You know, so it was amazing. It's been a long time coming mm -hmm. to, exactly. to see these type of results. Exactly. In this type of big advance. And the dastrolimab trial had similar results. So they saw a 72% um, lower risk of progression or death in the deficient MMR cohort. And then um, about a 37% lower risk in the overall uh, overall group. It's like you said, it's really impressive to see that considering we hadn't had this. Mm -hmm. um, looking at the trials themselves, 
it sounds like they present a significant change or an improvement from current correct treatment strategies. Would that be accurate to say? Absolutely, yeah. Okay. Obviously, as a you know a research academic myself, do you think there's any elements in either study, in your professional opinion, that you think warrant further investigation or that there's definitely follow-up studies? I'm assuming there's researchers around the world that are probably going to grab these studies and, yeah. and see what they can do to them. What further advancement do you think we need to do now? And are there any elements that you would love to see them probably pursue from you know the, the trials that we've read? So one of the things is both trials had very short follow-up. The pembrolizumab okay. trial only had 12 months of follow-up. Uh, the distarlimab trial had about two years of follow-up, which for, for clinical trials in cancer, you know that those tend to be on the shorter side. We tend to, most follow-ups are about five years. Okay. So um, I, you know, and I know that, that the authors of, of both studies are, are going to continue to do longer term follow-up, but I think the results were so exciting, they wanted to get them out to the community so that patients could start these treatments as soon as possible. Um, and so absolutely more follow-up is needed. Uh, the second thing is there was kind of a, a group that is a, that is a gray zone on, in okay. both trials. So in the pembrolizumab trial, this group was actually ex excluded. It was included in the, the sarlimab trial, but it was such a small, um, small proportion. And again, the follow-up was so short that um, we don't really know what to do with them. And that's the stage 3C disease. What this is is women who um, uh, undergo surgery and have a lymph node dissection and then ha end up having one or two positive lymph nodes, but they don't have you know, um, disease in the peritoneal cavity. So usually with, you know, with advanced stage three and stage four, um, you can have, you know, that's disease in, in, in other parts of the abdomen, the omentum, the, the liver, stomach, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and in the pembrolizumab trial, the patients who were included in that trial had to have measurable disease, meaning that you had to be able to see on CT scan um, that you, they had disease. And then as they got treatment, you know, and repeated their imaging, you could see a, a measurable response. And, and that is pretty typical for a lot of clinical trials because they want to actually be able to measure how much response their treatment is, is providing. The distarlimab trial included the 3C patients. Okay. Um, however, again, it was a small portion had 3C and, the, and they say, you know, the, the follow-up was not really long enough for them to be able to see if there was a difference in the two groups, placebo versus um, immunotherapy group. Um, so I think that's kind of a gray zone. I'd like to see more research and, and information about what to do with that specific patient population. In the NCCN guidelines, which um, to their credit was updated very quickly after these trials okay. were released in March, um, the, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's basically uh, approved for all stage three and stage four. Um, here at Cleveland Clinic Abu Dhabi, our GYN oncology team, you know, we discuss all new options and treatment for patients. Um, we discussed it and we've decided that uh, even women with 3C disease, we're going to offer the immunotherapy treatment because um, they are, you know, a high risk, uh, a high risk category. Inclusion criteria, always a very difficult Thing with clinical trials, particularly when they're on the precipice of, of new research. Um, I think you've just touched on that there. We, we talked about how you feel that these um, clinical trials are going to impact your own clinical practice mm -hmm. um, as a surgical oncologist. So you mentioned that patients, even slightly outside of that inclusion criteria for these trials, will now be incorporated in, and then definitely those that were in the study will receive it as correct, well. Correct. All women with stage three and stage four disease, yeah. We'll be getting it. Um, is there anything about the studies overall that you would like to add that you feel we haven't touched on today or are we just excited for our patients moving um, forward? I think I'm, well, I'm very excited for my patients for sure. Um, one thing I, I'd like to note was that was very interesting is in the pembrolizumab trial, the adverse events were the same in both the placebo group and okay. the immunotherapy group. Yeah. Um, that was not seen in, in the distarlimab trial. The distarlimab trial actually reported more adverse events in their immunotherapy group um, but in, Pem in the Pembro study, they basically found that there was the side effects were toxicities were as expected, yep. and that there was not any increase in toxicity if you gave pembrolizumab. So that's you know not only is this um, improving overall survival, you know, and progression-free survival for our patients, 
but it's actually you know doing it in such a way that's not increasing toxicity at the same time. I mean, that's just it's amazing. It's the best you can ask for, mm -hmm. I think, mm -hmm. when you're looking at clinical trials. Um, I know for everyone listening, I mean, I've thoroughly enjoyed you sharing your knowledge on these clinical trials, and I'm hoping that the professionals in your space will take a lot from this episode. Um, if you are a professional listening to this podcast, you're someone in the gynecological oncology field or in the MENA region, and that you would love to refer a patient or seek consult from Dr. Stephanie Ritchie, um, please reach out to us via clevelandclinicavadabi.ae or we will put the physician referral um, link for you in the description of this podcast. Thank you again for listening with us today. Thank you, Dr. Ritchie, for being here with us. And remember, hit like, subscribe, and join us for the next episode of The Doc Is In.